Right, everyone, welcome to another episode of Raising the Bar. And today I'm happy to introduce this fellow. His name's Brendan Murphy. He's the author of The Grand Illusion, the Truth Truthiverse podcast, and founder of Truthiversity. And uh, yeah, he's uh, a guy that I resonated with with his channel. I spotted him a few weeks ago and I was like, I have to get this guy on for, for a chin wag. We've connected uh, time zones here. And I just thought, for everyone uh, watching, we we're just going to do just going to have a conversation. We're going to talk about the overlap between our channels and stuff like that. So uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Brendan, I noticed you on your channel. I, I think you, you talked about what your second book. The the main thrust of that is it's a very very deep, very comprehensive, quite unique piece of research into the afterlife and anything connected to that realm. Um, so yeah, I've been. <laughs> Chipping away at this for years, it really needs to just be done and published. <laughs> Fair enough. So, you've what's been happening? You've interviewed loads of people that have had the after after death experiences of you, or what's been your line of inquiry with that? Um, on the podcast, I've generally just sort of gone with whoever I felt like you know had something interesting to say at the time. Um, in whatever the realm, you know, uh, doesn't doesn't necessarily have to be that stuff. You know, as you saw, I spoke to to Sari and I got him on to talk about neo feminism. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, you know. Yeah. had icon a couple of years ago to talk about his stuff and just whatever interests me at the time you know i, I prefer mm -hmm. to do that than than focus on the one thing constantly i mean because i'm so focused on the book every you know every day or every other day that it's good yeah. to have a break and you know yeah fair enough stuff. but but in terms of the book though did you how is it being compiled have you actually just interviewed loads of people that have had the after death experience or what's it been or your own theories on it yeah, it's kind of um, it's a, it's very research based. Um, but you know, I've had my own experiences with altered states of consciousness, and mm. um, you know, I've been reading about this type of stuff for the last twenty years. So, uh, because I'm because I'm a generalist and I'm a multidisciplinary kind of person, I pull massive amounts of disparate sort of information from different fields together um mm. so that we can build a perspective view of things that isn't common. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Um, and what's been your, what would you say is the kind of conclusion with that, with the after death experiences? Because I've just, I just spoke to a guy and um, he was dead for 30 minutes. And um, he talked about this afterlife of beautiful light. And, um, you know, it was high resolution. It wasn't dreamlike. It was like this, but just everything was light based, illuminary, you know, and he, um, they were like, he said he, he could fly to different cities and stuff with his friends. And he, he met the people that he killed in this afterlife and i found it quite fascinating and i also spoke to another um author who'd written a book I've forgotten his name now eben something and um and it does oh, seem to, alexander yeah. yeah it does seem to be there is there is a consistency amongst these people that are having these after life after death experiences so can't be completely written off can it no there's there's massive consistency it's actually quite astonishing when you see it and and you get pieces of evidence like um eben, eben alexander he encountered a, a girl um, in in the depths of his NDE where he didn't know who this person was, mm. um, this spirit that he was encountering, um, and they were flying on the wing of a butterfly, a huge butterfly or something. You know, it was one of these sort of weird, surrealistic, afterlife mm. kind of visionary experiences. But he's being guided by this woman. And anyway, after the experience ends and, he, you know, his brain starts to recover and he comes back to conscious, normal life, mm. um, he's going through like an old family photo album and he sees the picture of this woman and he realises this is actually, I say woman, let me just say a female <laughs> of some age. Yeah. I don't want to specify because I'm, I'm yeah. going off my memory here. Yes, I read right. it a long time ago. He sees a picture of this, this girl and he realises it's the girl from the NDE and it's actually his sister, his sister of his his long lost sister who i don't think he knew even existed because you know it's one of those cases where the, the parents don't tell the kid and there's actually multiple examples of that where someone dies they go they cross over and they they find a sibling that they did not know existed and they come back and they start talking about this brother or sister and their parents are like oh my god how do, how do you know about this because we never told you and it's there's multiple instances wow yeah it's fascinating isn't it Absolutely. I've, I didn't realise that happened to him. I, I'll have to go back and watch our chat again with Evan. I don't know if you mentioned I'm sure yeah. you must have mentioned that because it seems quite significant. It, yeah, it's fairly significant, <laughs> yes. And I, I don't know if he would have skipped over that because, I mean, that yeah. was the, one of the key things that actually showed that he had a legitimate experience that had some objective truth to it. I'll tell you about a dream I had because it's quicker and easier to explain. So I was in a dream and I'm on a public train, like a, you know, um, overground train and sat opposite me 
is a guy and and he's got a rucksack and he's he, and this this scene goes on for about a minute i would say and he slowly reaches out like comedy style reaches out like the you know the, the detonator the handle to push down and as he pushes it down there's a big explosion and in that moment i wake up And I realized that big explosion that happened was my housemate coming in and shutting the door. So that made me think that what happens is that that door slam was always there. But what it did is it rolled the dream narrative backwards through my mind. And I read it forwards, if you like. And Mm so I think that that, Mm -hmm. that can often be the case. So I potentially what could be happening with Eben there is... Um, he's seen the photo with his what was it his uh his sister did he say Mm -hmm. yeah 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 his sister i believe yeah so and i mean there could there could be other explanations of that whereby um he might have as, as a young kid heard a conversation with his mum and dad talking about it as a baby or something like that and it stayed in his memory and then he's formed that narrative in a kind of a dreamlike sequence to make sense of that what, what he's been told i know that's a little bit kind of mumble jumbled what i've said there but i'm trying to say there's different ways that the our minds can process information i've got another ayahuasca one but i don't know if that kind of made sense It, it does. And yeah, the last thing you're talking about is, is cryptomnesia, where that yeah. memory gets hidden and buried and then it comes gets triggered later on and people go, oh, my yeah. God. But um, yeah, it, yeah, it's it's it, it can sometimes be relevant, but it doesn't explain the multiple, multiple instances, which I've documented a whole bunch of them in, in this mm. second book where people access information that they simply have never, ever had access to before. Oh. All right. Can you give us a little insight into that? <laughs> kind of any examples? Uh, well, I mean, you know, talking about, the, you know, people people discovering brothers and sisters who the family had kept a secret, never mentioned, never talked about yeah. this kind of stuff, or just going somewhere and seeing something and and going, oh, that's interesting, um, and like a remote city. Um, and then, you know, the layout of the city somehow, like you go and visit it and you're like, oh, I know, if we go right here, turn right here, you know, and, and they go right and they're like, the person with you is going, we've never been here. How do you know all this kind of thing? Like this, this kind of stuff is, mm. is actually pretty widely documented. This, this information access that is mm. physically impossible, but possible if you work with a, a broader paradigm of, you know, consciousness, not being restricted to the inside of your skull. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So in that instance, was that like a previous lifetime? Is that what the conclusion was with that? Oh, well, one one example of that uh, is George Ritchie, who had his NDE when he was 20 years old. It's one of the most extensive that's been documented. And he was roaming around. He was in the army. He was roaming around the army barracks at the time. And, and he, he first he found himself outside of the he'd been placed on the on a bed, you know, because he physically died. Mm. And, um, you know, he realized, oh, the body under the sheet here. Shit, that's me. That's my physical body. Oh, shit, I'm dead. <laughs> and then he's roaming around the halls of the, these barracks trying to get somebody's attention. But all the people who are he's walking past are ignoring him because they can't see him. Um, yeah. But then he he ends up going and flying, sort of astral traveling to a, a remote city, this location he's never been to before. And then, you know, the, it's quite a detailed story. I talk about it in the book, but he yeah. ends up coming back to his body. Um, and thanks to the quick thinking of a young lad who was on site, they managed to revive him um, with a quick injection of, I think, adrenaline mm. um, or something similar. And so he woke up and with a start, but he had this information of this this layout of this city. Um, and when he went there and visited with a friend, he was able to verify this is where we go right here. We turn left here. We go. That's it. But he'd never actually visited the place before. And it really blew people's minds. He was able to describe where things were and anticipate where things were. Just as an example, I mean, that was a very nutshell vision. His, his experience was much more extensive than that. You know, he's watching yeah, yeah. people do certain things. Um, you know, it was very in involved, but um, one of the more solid, impressive ones on on record. Yeah, that actually, I just saw a um, a, a, a clip from uh, Ghost, the movie. You know, Patrick, you know, Patrick Swayze, and uh, when he's actually in the hospital and he's watching some other guy die, and like the spirit goes up, and then another ghost comes and sit next to him, and he's walking around, and he realizes that no one's actually getting his attention because he's, you know, he's dead, obviously. But um, but that, but so he actually had that experience in the hospital, and then how did he, how did he remote travel then? How did he just did he just start flying? Basically, yeah, he flew. Uh, that was his his experience. Um, right. And that that whole thing about you know people trying to get somebody's attention yeah. while while they're having an ND, 
or an out-of-body experience and flailing around going, why are yeah. you ignoring me? Yeah. Um, is very widely reported. And um, and some very profound experiences have have taken place in, in that kind of a way. And people, uh, one guy managed to track down, one guy was in an accident, a car accident. Mm. Um, I document this one in the book and, as well. So, you know, if I'm vague here, the details are in the book. But uh, mm -hmm. he, he um, there was a woman who came along to the roadside and helped to resuscitate and rescue him. Um, and he remembered that he saw the site while he was in his out of body state. He mm. saw the side of the van, and he remembered like the name of the company on the side of the van in mm. his out of body state. And that, that he actually managed to retain that piece of information when he was revived and came back to his, his physical body. Anyway, the van drove off. Everybody dispersed and went about their lives. But he managed to track down the company. And when he found the company, he found the woman who actually found him on the roadside and helped to revive him. And they had this very emotional reunion mm. <laughs> based on that piece of information that he got while he was physically dead. Oh, and he actually he saw the, the name of the company and then he contacted them. Yeah, he found he, he yeah. in his out of body state. He saw yeah. this on the side of the truck. Yeah. And then later on, he went and contacted them and, found, and actually tracked down the woman. And That's they nice. had a very, very powerful uh, reunion of sorts. It was quite amazing. That is actually, that's crazy, man. Do you, do you think there's a strong connection between um, the after-death experience and, and the dream state? Yeah, there, there is. Uh, they're related. They are related. Um, it's not that one is the same as the other, but they are related because you're in a, I mean, when you're dreaming, you're essentially your locus of awareness shifts to, you know, what you might call the astral body. Um, you know, people like Robert Monroe are using their astral body to go venture, venture here, venture there, travel to different places. When people have an NDE, that's basically the realm that they're operating in is the so-called astral realm through through that that subtle body, um, which we're characterizing now as a plasma body because that's where, excuse me, that's where the science is kind of leading us when we connect these these dots. Um, so I don't know where I was going with that. I got sidetracked with plasma. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no dream state. I was just wondering if there's a connection here yeah, with, the, with the dream yeah. state, <laughs> um, because I, I, yeah. I mean, I've had I've had vivid dreams. I lucid dream a lot, but um, you know, I I'm, I'm always trying to contact dead people in my dreams. But I, after a while, I realise it's still just a projection of my mind, my imagination. Because um, I even did it last yep. night. I contacted an old friend in my dream, lucid dream, and I I called him, and he came, and it kind of vaguely looked a little bit like him. And then we hung out for about five minutes, and then after the five minutes, it's just turned into a completely different person and then i'm like you're not really him and then i called him again and then a more more of a likeness of him came along and i realized that that's probably not him either you know it's just my mental projection but uh, i'm wondering um whether that is connected to the after death experience or whether it's sort of you know there's layers to it you know and it go and you kind of go, you go yeah through these layers to more of a kind of non-personal experience where it's all kind of connected you know like coming out of your house and connecting to the neighborhood in a way that kind of thing it it really is like they're all connected. Let me give you let me give you an actual um a case of of like a a, a dream, right? Because you're talking yeah. about dreams. There is this sort of there are layers, and it's not just like a black and white thing. So you have to be a little bit nuanced with this stuff if you want to connect dreams to the yeah. afterlife because they kind of are happening in a very similar kind of frequency band. But I'll give you an example from uh, I found this this was uh, found this is a case from Anthony Peake who's who's a good writer in these in these uh, subjects. Um, so he tells the story of a girl called a, a woman called Samantha Treasure who was a London-based Canadian parapsychology researcher, and she was 15 when she had a vivid dream in which her sister let a white cat in from the backyard, and it then entered her bedroom and engaged in conversation with her. Then following this dream, she's at school and she's leaving a German class and she encounters her best friend and she starts telling him about how she can't stop thinking about the dream she had last night. But he interrupts her as she's telling it and he goes, about a white cat. And that was completely unprompted, but he then detailed all of the major aspects of the dream back to her who was abs and she was absolutely gobsmacked. Her jaw was just on the ground. And so she's like, how do you know about this dream that I had? How do you know in such detail mm -hmm. of what it was all about and the contents of it? Yeah. And he smiled and goes, because I was the cat. Oh, my God. No way. <laughs> That's crazy. And he felt confident about that as well. And there was like a, yeah. 
you can you can visit people. It's it's documented. We have some pretty interesting yeah. cases. Robert Munro appeared to a friend of his, and and uh, they described him as looking like a, I think it was a filmy piece of chiffon, uh, <laughs> in his out of body state. Uh, yeah, I mean Don de Gracia is another astral astral explorer, and he mm. told a story of uh, trying to contact a friend of his, and his friend was. I think he found him sort of out wandering in the astral plane, but the problem is his mate was asleep. So when people are asleep dreaming and essentially asleep in the astral plane, they're not really consciously process, processing, it, yeah, processing anything. They're not really very lucid. Mm -hmm. So trying to communicate with them can be challenging, but he was trying to tell his friend, this is really important. Remember this, this conversation and ring me when you wake up tomorrow morning. Um mm -hmm. And so anyway, the long story short was his mate, uh, I believe, did get in contact with him because he had a vague feeling that he should make a phone call to him uh, the next morning. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy, isn't it, what, what can go on? I mean, I've, I've fallen in love with girls in my dreams and I'm like, oh, my God, I'm this is like heartbreaking because I know I'm going to wake up and I'm never going to see you again. So I've like asked for their Instagrams and then I've like woken up and then like try to type it in and it's like, it's not true. It's not real. You know, I'm like, fuck. <laughs> yeah. you know, I'll get like a little bit of information. I'll quickly wake myself up. I'll usually ask for their social media handle. Then I'll wake myself up and I realize, oh, okay. It was just like all made up the way that I check. So the way that I check to see if it's a real experience or not is um, you'll, I'll ask them a question like, what's your name? And then the way to do it is like, wait 10 seconds and ask their name again. And um, you will usually find it's they'll give you a complete a different answer or um, uh, something else I do is I'll get them to talk. And as they're talking, I'll count to 10. So as I'm counting one, two, and you're talking three, four, as you're talking in the dream, like you'll, you'll start saying one, two, three with me because it's like I can't process those two things at the same time. And I'm going, ah. Your projection of my mind, buddy. Fuck off. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and so I've I always yeah. test that on. Yeah. Um, I test that on dream characters, and everyone's failed so far. So I know that it's just my um, my own projection of my own mind. But I would love to have that kind of non personal experience. But would you say then? Let's say uh, let's say you're in Australia and you're awake and I'm asleep. And I let's say I visited you in a dream. Would you have to be asleep for me to see you in a dream? Do you think? um sorry say it again yeah Who's i'm just thinking asleep? like to, to meet someone uh, in a dream um would they also have to be asleep and dreaming then i'm guessing because if you're the other side of the world and you're awake and i'm sleeping is it still possible or not uh, the simple answer to that is that it, i mean to meet them in a dream they need to be dreaming <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah um <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to be trying to get the attention of someone whose whose awareness is is fixed in their physical body, yeah. you know, consciousness, and that's going to be a lot harder because they're they're not tuned into the frequency you're operating on. Um, mm -hmm. And I just found a little example of you know what can happen. Like I mentioned, Don de Gracia, and he did a projection to somebody um, who was a roommate of his at the time, and mm -hmm. he managed to half wake him up, and he, and he the guy sort of blearily you know opened his eyes and said, mm -hmm. "Oh, you look like a haze." You look like a haze, but um, yeah, you gotta to mm. have the. It would be really interesting. I mean, we've got both sides of the coin. We've got people who have seen in a waking state. They've seen their friend doing a projection or a visiting visiting mm. spirit entity or whatever. But we've also got the the cases of people meeting up in this sort of astral dreamscape and yeah. um and having a, a sort of verifiable experience. Although it's funny, I've, I think the the dream meetings are a little bit less commonly documented. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've, I had a, a lucid dreaming guy on and um, I've forgotten his name. I'm going to put it in, flash it up. But um, I said, look, I'm going to meet you in a dream. Like he's like, a, you know, one of the biggest lucid dream authors. And I came back and he sent me a little, a couple of little challenges to ask him. And I came back and I gave it to him and he didn't remember it. He, he, he said, you know, I, he doesn't recall it. But I told him all this stuff that he's the dream character of him said to me. And it was just complete. It was just felt like complete waffle. But I don't know. Maybe maybe you can take something <laughs> from it or not. But, you know, one of the things he said was that the lion lies down in crisis. That's what I heard from his dream character said to me. So I gave it to him, and he kind of backwards. He kind of reverse engineered that to kind of fit things that might have happened in his life. But who knows, man? You know, who knows? Uh, I mean, I'm I'm going to keep trying uh, it. Yes, I'm going to keep trying it because I think yeah, yeah. there's got to be something in it. You know, there has to be some kind of thing in it. I mean, another lucid dream I had was where, no, before the lucid dream, I said to my friend, 
is there anything that you've said to me in the past, like a bit of information, like what school you went to, anything like that, that I can't remember now. I'm going to go into my dream and I'm going to ask for that information. I'm going to come back with it. And um, he goes, all right, yeah, like, ask me what's, what primary school I went to, because I definitely did ask you that. I went, yeah, okay, because I can't remember it. So that night I went into a lucid dream and I and I was calling for him and I could, he couldn't get hold of him. So I called him on the, on the dream phone and he answered. And um, he said, um, Osage. I went to Osage school, right? And I kind of woke up and I said, look, hey, mate, I've got the answer. Is it Osage school? He goes, no, no, it's not Osage. I'm like, damn. Anyway, I'm going that evening. I go to my, I'm driving to my squash club. Okay. It's a 10 minute drive. I've always gone the same way every single day, like thousands of times. Right. For some reason at this mini roundabout, I just do a right just for no reason. I'm just like, this is bizarre. Why have I gone down here? It's like, you know, the same pack, the same trip you'd always do over and over again. I just go down this path. And I was like, right, I'm going to do a U-turn in the road like a three point, three point turn, I'm going to spin back round. As I'm spinning in the side of the road, I look up and it says Osage school just there. Right. <laughs> and I'd never seen that word Osage before. And I'm just looking at it. It's right there, mm -hmm. Osage. And I'm like, bloody. Hell. So it's, I'm, I'm wondering whether, yeah, I mean, it's, there's some kind of crazy sort of, I don't know if it's time dilation, but where things can bleed in from the, the future and the past, you know what I mean? And it, it can come through that way. Yeah. Um, but, Totally. Yeah. So that wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't like a hit. I wouldn't say that was a hit, but there was something in that, you know, there's something in that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, th the way that I've been looking at it for quite a long time and I'm not alone in this um, is when you, when you shift up a up dimensional level, say, or up a density level, you, that higher level encompasses the, all of the time and all of the space of the lower level. So if you're going like in your dream state, you're you're shifting up a dimensional level into let's call it the astral yeah. plane, and then everything in the physical world suddenly is, becomes like a point, and you can see it's like you can see the entire timeline kind of thing. Mm. Um, and so th then you can come back to the physical, and you've got maybe information that you shouldn't have, but be it's because you are at that higher dimensional level where you had access to the entire you know timeline or time space mm. matrix of the lower dimensional level. So every time you go up. You encompass the the level below, and that's what I think. That's what is happening in a sense. You know, we we are getting this kind of, and then it looks like we get we get this backwards through time effect yeah. where you go and or you you know like you try your brain tries to make sense of things that are, are not linear, um, and it's not linear because of this dimensional kind of interface. <laughs> yeah, it's almost that 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 layer there is. Um, there's no such thing as time. I think it's just like a quantum soup um mm. where the time the, the the past the present the future is all kind of jumbled up and um you can kind of draw from it and you can create a linear pro you can create some kind of linear timeline from it but in that in that actual realm it's all kind of anything goes <laughs> you know what i mean um like a pool of potential i don't know what you'd call it i mean i also had that experience on ayahuasca but um but yeah it's still fascinating what can be drawn from it i think um it's mm. yeah, very interesting to think about yeah any 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 sort of similar experiences for you kind of um trippy sort of stuff like that trippy i haven't had a lot of I'm, my dreams have been disappointingly boring i have to say um i've had like experiences of of uh infinite consciousness in meditation and this kind of thing so like very very vastly expanded um, kind of like bypassing all the intermediate levels um, for some reason that seems to be a tendency with me um, I've had it I've actually you know you mentioned the the Osage thing and and something else before that earlier yeah um, I remember one time I was I was back when I was living with my my, my parents original house the one I grew up in um, my bedroom was down the end of the house and they had a down the other end was the kitchen and a radio was playing mm. um, I woke up one morning uh, just before I woke up I was having a dream about um being at a beach and having like this wall this huge wall of sand like crumbling down behind me like chasing me um mm. and i'm trying to get away so i don't get buried under this huge wall of sand and i get up and i walk, walk out of, get out of bed i walk down the hall and as i get into the kitchen there's a news story talking about these uh somebody who'd been at a beach and dug a massive hole and this huge wall of sand had caved in on them um and that was mm. i mean i don't it was like the dream must have happened seconds before the material came through on the radio. But but in that astral dream space, it's not a separate thing. It's not a linear right. thing. It's like we can look down at the whole timeline and go, yeah. oh, okay, well, so there. this is the radio broadcast over here in the future. 
Uh, but we're going to work that into the dream that you're going to have a few seconds, you know, Before. beforehand kind of thing. Exactly. That's what I'm saying right. about the um, when when my housemate came in and slammed the door and it created that ex explosion. How is it that my mind knew to create a whole time sequence with this guy like the terrorist doing the uh, the detonator? How did it know that that my housemate was going to walk in just at that moment? Just when the bang went, like, how is that? So I, the, the only conclusion I can form from that is um, the dream memory was created in the moment of that bang. And my mind interpreted it forward, like it kind of rolled the dream backwards and I kind of processed it forwards. Maybe that happened with you there. There's another way of, of putting it is that you could say that the, the door had already slammed from yes. the perspective of you in a dream. The door's already slammed because you're not operating in the linear time space anymore. Uh, explain that one. <laughs> okay, let me let me get. But your brain, brain. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so like it's like your it's like your astral consciousness gets to see all of that happen, and it's like it can just look at it all simultaneously, yes. going, "Okay, I'm sleeping here. Yeah, the door slams here, but it's all the same moment." Yeah, it's all the same moment that you're looking at because you're in the higher dimensional space. But then when you come back into the 3D space in your body, your brain has to basically convert it into a linear sequence of events to try exactly. to make sense of it, even though exactly. it's exactly that, linear. That, that's what I think. Yeah, that's what that's what I think is probably the case. Yeah, when I, mean, I have it, when I'm just when I'm falling asleep and I'm getting right sleepy, I notice the thoughts in my head come as memories, and then usually I just like fall asleep. But then if I just keep myself awake and put my awareness onto that memory i go oh no i've just created that in that moment that never actually happened it's like that i'm just sort of mm. really trying to put my awareness onto it so it's almost like or well, like deja vu would be an example you know where you have a kind of it feels like a memory it feels like you've been here before but when i really put my awareness onto it i realize it's just this is um this is something that i've just created in that moment it's not it isn't actually a legitimate memory it's just it's all occurring in that moment <laughs> super super difficult to make sense of unless you're working with like a hyperdimensional kind of a mm. uh, a model. Um, otherwise, your brain goes in circles trying to make it linear, make yeah. it work in a linear way. But it it, it doesn't like deja vu doesn't yeah. really work in a linear way. When people have those experiences where, mm. and, and there's actually something called future memory, which I think uh, PMH Atwater coined the term future memory, mm. where people get to, they have an experience that is a literal immersion experience of the, what we would think of as the future, but it hasn't happened yet, but they're having this experience. And then, you know, a couple of weeks later, that exact scenario that they've already lived through in their mind mm. happens to, to the T and in precise mm. detail um, in a way that, you know, they've got no control over, but this is the thing about being able to shift, you know, dimensional perspectives. It's the only way it works is from a, a hyper-dimensional perspective where you, mm. at that level, Everything down in physical 3D world is just a single point happening. It's all it's all there available to our awareness um, without the linearity and the separation. We can see it all happen, but then we come back to 3D brain-based awareness and we we have to kind of make sense of it in a way that yeah, it's like, yeah. oh, okay, well, this happened, this happened, this happened. It's like it doesn't really work, but it it work. those really, the really yeah. high-quality experiences are the ones that show us that there's something much more interesting happening than just uh, the mind kind of, you know, yeah, entertaining yeah. itself. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to give you. I'm going to give my ayahuasca story because this totally fits into what we're talking about here. So it was my first. Nice. Uh, it was my first. I, I know people have a, some people have a funny relationship with it, but I think you know everything's worth trying once. You know, well most things. Um, so okay. I, I, it was my initiation. I had double the dose, so it was obviously quite. I was you know it, it kind of knocked knocked the bollocks out of me, and um, I remember. I would say for people that haven't don't know about ayahuasca, it's just, you know, let's just say D, it's like DMT. Um, you you go on journeys. People might call them hallucinations, but, you know, the, 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 the shaman's term is a journey. And what happened was that as I was deep into that journey, I kind of opened my eyes and everyone was in the room, but a trippy stuff was happening in the timeline. So, for instance, I would think to myself, oh, God, I wish someone would just... Uh, you know, blow that candle out. It's really annoying me. As I'm thinking it, someone just immediately blows it out literally one second later. And then I'm going, oh, now I can't see where my um, my water is. Like, how am I going to find my water? And in that moment, someone has a, the, the Mapacha cigar and I can see the red ember of the cigar. And in that exact moment, he he walks across the room and he stops. If you can see, he kind of stops there. And it's I just go, 
okay, let's put my hand down. And my hand lands absolutely flush on the bottle. Like it doesn't even slip off the, the top of it. It just lands straight on it, like bang, like that. And I'm like, wow, that's incredible. And then everything was happening like that. You know, I was thinking, I was even thinking in my head, um, God, I've almost reached the God self where I can just think of anything and it will come to me. And just as I'm thinking that I puke on myself, you know, and it's almost like a lesson to say, don't get ahead of yourself. You're not God, you know. And then in that moment, <laughs> no one can really hear that either. It's kind of silently puked on myself. I hear these mutterings in, in the room going, ha, 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 like that. Mm. So I'm taking that as they're kind of saying to me, don't get ahead of yourself. You're not God. It's like, you know, pull it back in. But in my, the, the narrative that I was forming was that I can, it's like Bruce Almighty. I can kind of think anything and it will manifest it. You see what I mean? And um, this happened again where I was like, well, if I'm if I can manifest anything, can I have like, um, you know, a hot chick just to emerge here? And in that moment, like you, everyone in the room went ah, da, 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 like that, you know, so as if to say, <laughs> fuck off, John, you know, <laughs> but they were just like in their in their realities in their narratives, they were just clearing their throat or do it having their mm. own independent. But it was almost like I was pulling everything in the room and authoring my own timeline based on what I believe to be happening, but they were having their own separate experience, if that kind of makes sense. So yeah, and it, it kind of, it went on like that. There was, there's many other things where, you know, I really needed something or I wanted something. And in that moment they would come over to me or I said, I, I really wish someone would come over to me. And someone in that exact moment went, John, are you okay? Like, so for me, the, my conclusion with that is, um, yeah, I don't really have one, but it's, it's, the mind trying to form a linear sequence. It's almost like all that chaos happened and it, I, it reverse engineered a narrative through it because everyone else is having a completely separate experience. They weren't thinking, oh, John needs water. I'm going to walk over here with the cigar. Like that was completely separate, but it was like, yeah, it's, it, it, it can't even really explain it because it's so, yeah, jumbled up. I'll tell you, no, man, I like it. It's, um, it reminds me of like in in the first book I wrote about this. So I had one of my early in the early early days of my you know awakening process. I had a bunch of synchronicity synchronicity happening. Uh, ugh, my tongue's not working. Synchronicities happen, um, but <clears throat> one of the most epic ones I, I included in the book. I was sitting on the couch. This is back in my parents' house. I was sitting on the couch. I had in the background there was a radio playing. I'm reading this book that called the Holographic Universe, which you probably probably know of, and. That was the book that that blew me open and, and started me down this whole path. So I'm reading this book called The Holographic Universe. It's about the holographic nature of reality. The whole point of it is everything's interconnected. The internal world is reflected in the out, the external world. This is the holographic kind of principle, yada, yada. And I'm reading this book about synchronicity. I'm reading the chapter on synchronicity. And inside the chapter on synchronicity about inside this book, The Holographic Universe, uh, it starts talking about the... Um, the activist pioneer uh, Rosa Parks from the the US, and she was the woman who was you know largely held responsible for the amazing uh, the Montgomery bus boycott and you know pushing forwards to African Americans being able to sit on a bus, you know, yeah. heaven forbid. Uh, and so she was key; she was instrumental in this in this very important movement. But as I'm reading this passage about Rosa Parks in the context of synchronicity inside a book about the holographic nature of reality. The radio in the background in the kitchen starts talking suddenly about the, the hosts of the show starts suddenly talking about Rosa Parks. And I'm sitting there going, whoa, like what are the odds uh, that I would be sitting here listening to the radio at all mm. with, you know, I'm normally not here, let alone what are the odds they talk about Rosa Parks just off the cuff, mm. let alone while I'm reading about Rosa Parks, let alone in a passage, the context of which is synchronicity mm. in a book about the holocaust nature of reality i mean this is astronomical yeah yeah no that's crazy absolutely crazy. i mean i have a i have a coincidence diary so i have a dream diary and i have a coincidence yeah. diary and um i might just dig it up here so i mean you tell me what are the odds of this okay so exactly like that i'll be i'll be writing a word on a bit of paper let's say let's say it's just making notes and as i'm writing i'll be i'll come to the word holographic and just as I'm writing the word holographic, the TV will say the word holographic, right? What what are the odds of that happening when you really break it down? Like how many words are there in the dictionary? You know, 
tens of thousands, right? Like what are the odds on me writing the word holographic and the word holographic coming out of the radio or on the TV or something like that, right? I'm like, I have to write that word down. So basically, I, every time, and this ha I get this at least once a week. I'll have that happen where I'm t I'm talking with you, and then a bus will go past, and on the on the advert, it will have that word that I've just said in that exact moment as the bus is going past, as a synchronicity, you know. So I've got like a coincidence diary that I've got, and I just write down, um, I write down all of them that happen. Um, so yeah, like I'll read some out here. Like you can, I'll, I'll show you. There, there's there's loads. So these are all the ones that happen like that. So what are the odds of that happening that many times? So I've had like fun, mind, cook, assists, heart, play, uh, break up, buy, change, uh, Iceland, time, guest, two, police, boxer, little, effect, top. Like, so I'm, what I do is I kind of try and, um, I mean, there's like there's dozens. I mean, the odds on that is just insane. So I'm trying, what I do is I kind of use that as a little bit of a, a guide for me you know um i kind of yeah do you notice, do you notice like uh you know is it happening do you get a certain kind of a message or a confirmation of something or is it just, just an amazing coincidence yeah i mean i i don't it's it, it's how you want to see it if you see everything as coincidence then yeah you can kind of ignore it but um if you see everything as interconnected then maybe that is a little bit of a it could be a nudge giving me a nudge in a, in a certain direction or i take some things to mean yeah, you're on the right track kind of thing. Um, that's the right way of thinking. Like I'll, I'll have a thought in my head. Sometimes I'm thinking something and I'll hear it. And I've got a slightly different uh, diary for that as well. So I kind of break them up as well. And sometimes that for me is telling me that's the right idea. Yeah, you want to continue with that. So, um, but yeah, so I've got this, my little coincidence diary that I do. But I mean, what are the chances of all those words as you're, as you're writing it or just seeing it, you hear it. It's just... You know, and there's dozens of them I get, you know, at least one a week. Uh, I um, I, I have some that are so insanely astronomically improbable that I, I can't even talk about them because you need to actually write it out so that you get the details of it and the layers. Like yeah. I'll probably include a couple in, in book three because it yeah. goes into the, the collective unconscious and the way we're all interconnected. It's fascinating. I've got a friend in the UK, um, Nick Sandbrook, who, who has the most insane industrial scale not even synchronicity we need a, like we need another word for it it's so mm. bizarre what happens with him and his whole family get getting pulled into people's other people's narratives like they keep being put into people's films and plays and books and details my my new details of his life showing up in the writings of Philip K Dick and all this sort of stuff bizarre really bizarre over and over and over um and i live with my partner amy and i are so embedded in each other's fields that it's just it's gotten monotonous almost like i'll think something and then two or three seconds later she'll say it and and this is the pattern the pattern is i think it and then a few moments yeah. later she says it and it happens on a daily basis like it's so it's so quotidian now i don't even we barely even yeah. bother talking about it yeah and I, and i think this is what this is kind of connected to the mandela effect i think you know um the kind of bleeding of the, the bleeding between uh, of time between the future, the present and the past, you know, for instance, it's as if the past can be changed in the present moment. And then in that exact moment, it's always been like that, you know, and then it might change again, but then it's like in that present moment, oh no, but it's always been like that. There's a scene in Red Dwarf. And then if you know, it's like a comedy, like uh, sci-fi from Britain. It's like, it was one of my favorite TV shows from the eighties uh, and nineties. Um, but there's one episode. Okay. In I've never watched Tell oh mate if you haven't seen red dwarf that is absolutely classic um but there's there's one episode and i think yeah. it's called it's to do with reality bumps so anyway they're kind of on this spaceship and then um they hit these bumps in the spacecraft and they go to take lister for a for a scan he's one of the main characters and they they do an x-ray and they see that he's actually a cyborg and the cyborg on the spacecraft is Crichton. he's like the the servant and he's going the hell man you've made you know you're making me be the servant and you're you're one of us you're one of me all, all along i'm afraid sir you are not human you are a droid technically subordinate to me what does this all mean so he swaps roles and he gets mm. lister to be like the the servant right and then they hit another reality bump so we just crashed through an unreality pocket which created a false reality making us believe <sighs> mr lister was oh my sir may i see your arm 
Mac. He looks normal, human. He is human, but you know, it kind of went back to the it kind of reset again. But in that in that reality bump, the the the, the past changed to form the new present. And I think it's kind of similar to that. It, that's what's kind of happening with the Mandela effect, I think, where it's possible that we have these reality bumps whereby the the past changed, but then in the present, we we kind of process that as it's actually always been like that until we hit, hit the next reality bump and it changes again. And then it's like, okay, well, you know, the past changed, but then it's always been like that. I don't know if you have any insights mm. into the Mandela effect. If you look into that, if you can connect it to the, what we've been talking about, it's that kind of hyper dimensionality where in that, in that kind of quantum field, it's, it's, it's kind of, it can all change, you know, the past, the present and the future. Totally. Totally. And, and quantum mechanics is saying, that's exactly what it's saying. Um, you know, they've done experiments where uh, measurements that took place, you know, in the, what was it? The state of a, a past measurement was affected by, um, the future measurement or the future measurement was affected by a previous measurement and there's this retro causality back and forth between time and this is our linear minds trying to make sense of of what is just the quantum field with its eternal nowness um and and then you, you have you know if you take that and apply it to like the whole mandela effect and the multiverse thing you know the multiverse idea i think has has some merit to it you know um philip k dick experienced memories of a life that he'd never lived before and it wasn't a past life thing. It was like he was adamant that he had memories from a parallel timeline that never eventuated here, but which he had somehow experienced. Um, and it's sort of like we get these branching, you know, the branching off of the timeline. We have the main timeline here and then we get an offshoot of it. And then, it, you know, some something happens and and there's a glitch or, you know, the whoever's overseeing this process doesn't like where it's going. And so they cancel that timeline and we revert back here. But now we've got memories from the parallel timeline, yes, exactly. uh, but we don't have any evidence of it, you know? That's exactly how I feel. Maybe, maybe that's what CERN is doing. I don't know where it's, it can kind of rip holes in the time continuum and actually push us onto a different timeline that they they want or something like that. But um, yeah, there was, oh my God, there was something I was going to say about that. Um, so that's what I think intuition is. Okay, so intuition, you know, when you feel like something's definitely going to happen, you, you don't know why, it's kind of irrational why you think it's going to happen, and you just know, and then it happens, right? I think it's because on a on a quantum level, you've actually already experienced that timeline. You've already been there in the future, right? You've had that experience. You've had all the experiences, but you kind of perceive it in, in this brain, in the, in the physical brain now, as in this is past, present, and future. You've had that experience, and it's like a memory of that, even though it's in the future, if you see what I mean, that's what I think intuition is. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. 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 And it's like, um, you know, the global consciousness project with um, Dean Radin and, and a bunch of other scientists, and they've got these random number generators all around the world. Yeah. And they found that when there's a global, like a, an event of global uh, proportions, like that everybody is focused on billions of people around the world, then mm -hmm. random number generators stop producing random numbers. They create order and coherence. Um, around the world so right. this is but this is here's the kicker right this is yeah. before the event takes place there's a window where there is order and coherence generated by these electronic devices and that is completely non-linear quantum behavior and that is an illustration of what we're talking about like on a say if we use this terminology of like the the astral level mm -hmm. the astral dimensionality that event has already happened from the perspective relative to us in in 3D. So that information is already there in the field, yeah. and then it starts to trickle in, in into this window preceding the actual 3D event, right? So what exactly happened there? So you're saying it was just random, random, randomly allocated numbers. So so they have these devices called random number generators, and they yeah. just spew out. Like it's basically just random yeah. quantum kind of noise, just yeah. number generation in, yeah. in random randomness, total randomness. Yeah. Um, you can't predict what it's going to do. So it's 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 completely um, what's the word? I forget the word. But anyway, that's what they do, and they have them all around the world. Yeah. And when an event, like say the the death of Princess Diana, right? Like yeah. something that gets everybody's attention and yeah. brought media outlets around the world are talking about it. Before the actual thing happens, like before she dies and before the media broadcasts start to kick off, there is a, a window of, say, you know, a number of hours, four hours, eight hours or whatever yeah. it happens to be before before it happens where the random number generators stop behaving randomly. 
and we're talking about multiple different devices yeah, what, around so, the world. So, so you, you get like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, like it goes into a sequence, you mean? Yeah, like it, it, I'm not sure exactly what the output is, but yeah. the, basically they stop behaving randomly and they synchronize in a sense. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, so it starts to take on some kind of connected pattern to it. Yeah. 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 It's no longer arbitrary. There's, right? there's a, it's yeah. It kind of takes on some kind yes. of coherent, fixed pattern. Yeah, just before the yeah, event. Yeah, for a, for a little yeah. exactly. Yeah, just before and maybe just after, while everyone's attention is about to become focused on it, and then while it wow. still is focused on it, you get this window of of order rather than total randomness. Well, if we look up, you look, you could look up random number generators and. Um, okay the GCP. Today, there are over 60 random event generators placed around the world. The numbers that come into the generators during normal random events for global consciousness are just that, random. Several hours in advance of a major world event, non-random, coherent numbers are present. A large spike in the data waveform appears giving a precognition that a major event is about to occur. The idea is these devices are being affected by the minds of yeah. people all around the world un unconsciously. Okay. So if you get enough, if you get enough minds focused on the one thing, mm -hmm. it creates a field effect around the world, mm -hmm. which produces a certain amount of order in the data that's being produced by the machines. But how do you input that? Like, how would it record that? Like, how would it take our, you know, let's say, how would it record us? Like, you would have to ask those guys about that. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Don't worry. Yeah, no, it's all good. I'll, I'll look into it. There are two satellites over the Northern Hemisphere. Every 30 minutes, they send back a signal telling scientists how strong this magnetic field of the Earth is. It's important because all life is connected to it. There is no them and us when it comes to the magnetic field of every CEO, of every corporation, every leader of every nation, every blade of grass, every hamster, every goldfish, every human is linked to this field. So what happens, the field is important. And what uh, scientists found is uh, 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, 15 minutes after the first plane hit the first tower, there was uh, a, a very unusual spike in the strength of the magnetic fields of the Earth attributed to the collective outpouring of human emotion, heart-based emotion, the strongest magnetic generator in, in the body. This also might connect to predictive programming as well. And like the way that we see it linearly is that we see it as something occurs in a movie or TV show and then the event happens and then we look back and we think, okay, that must have been put into the collective consciousness and then we've somehow cobbled that together and made that happen. That's kind of like the predictive programming way of thinking about it. Um, but what if what if that event happened and then the memory, the collective memory of that movie was created in that moment? So we actually created the movie. Let's say an event happens in the year uh, 2024. OK, and it's exactly like the movie from 1993. Right. Whatever. What if in 2024 we, the event happens and we think, oh, that was from the, the, the movie. But what if we actually all collectively remembered that? we created that movie in that moment in 2024 collectively i know that's a little bit but that's kind of what i'm getting at with my experiences in the psychedelic experience and, and the dreams and stuff like that where you can you create the past in that moment in the present moment and maybe that's really what predictive programming is i don't know yeah and and i think there's a lot of truth to that um and you know a lot of people in the like the conspiracy community are are very quick to attribute, you know, everything to a, a kind of ma a malicious mm. intent and a, a conscious intention. Whereas I think a lot of, you know, at least some of what happens is exactly what you're describing. It's it's that retro causality back and forth through time mm. um, that can't be explained in a Newtonian way. And and most conspiracy, yeah. you know, buffs don't think about things like that. Yeah, yeah. They're, well, they're not not really interested in that kind of level that layer are they they're more interested in the um the authorities trying to you know get them yeah which we're all dreaming we're all dreaming all that crap into existence as well like it's it's literally 
uh, just a it's like a hallucinatory you know psychedelic vision that we're all having right now it was just a dream that we're manufacturing yeah. um so you know running yeah. around pointing fingers at, at the you know the authorities and being angry with them is kind of you know pretty amusing from that level yeah it is yeah totally yeah this is why um paul levy Watika, he wrote a book about how we're kind of in in a collective dream we're all collectively dreaming this experience into being um and this has always been known you know going back mm -hmm. you know yep. thousands of years but we seem to think that we, we seem to have some kind of solipsistic idea and reality where we're at whereas we're actually all dreaming this into being we're we are the the creators and what's being created all at the same time collectively um yeah it's kind of like a yeah. Yeah, weird concept for people but um if you can understand the lucid dream where you know that as you're walking through your dreamscape you know that you are the creator of everything but you're also being created in that moment. If that, so if you can take that as a metaphor for life and extend it into your life, it kind of makes a little bit more sense that it's just another kind it's of- It's a perfect dream. analogy because- Yeah. Oh, exactly. It's perfect. The, the, the analogy is perfect. And that's that's one I've used before because it, it, it applies so well. Like if you have a dream, any kind of dream, you are manufacturing all the scenery, you're manufacturing all the characters, and then you're inserting yourself in it to play a role. So you, it's like this role-playing video game that you dive into to have this immersion experience. And everybody you interact with is a figment of your imagination. Literally, you've created them. The difference, the difference I think, with reality more broadly is that it's, more, it's a little bit more of a, a collaborative thing although it's valid to look at it both ways you know i like i could sit here and say i'm manufacturing i'm dreaming you into existence and you're dreaming me into existence and at the at root mm -hmm. it's all fundamentally true because there's only one of us here there's only one ultimately one field of consciousness creating the whole thing anyway <laughs> um and individuals can do this stuff as well i mean yeah. parapsychology is as thousands of experiments where you know people have demonstrated the ability to do to manipulate or influence all sorts of different objects or systems or what have you it's, it's not really it's not it's not new at all uh, or controversial even it's just yeah it's a, something something we can all do to various various extents i mean like an example of that is um a friend of mine vinit bartia he said to a group of us he said i want you to all think of a yellow umbrella and i want you to send me a photo when you see this yellow umbrella in your life you know and then and so about a week later, the other uh, another guy in the group, he sent a, a picture and he goes, look, I've, here's the yellow umbrella. And it took me about six months before I spotted the yellow umbrella and I took a photo of it. But in that moment, I had actually created that umbrella because until I've actually taken a photo of it, that, that didn't exist in my reality. So I, when I saw that, that had actually been created those six months previous. So that's an example of that kind of intention and reflection happening in real time, not in real time, but in protracted time so mm. i've set the intention it took a little bit while and then it, it manifested so we can create our realities to a certain extent just through the power of in of intention kind yep. of connected right completely that's right yeah it's like you know if you're doing it in a dream you would just get a, a faster response yeah. time you know like the umbrella would, would be there <laughs> exactly yeah yeah i wonder why it takes sort of longer to manifest things in this plane you know, of awareness you know yeah, I, I think that um, it's just part and parcel of the the type of game that we're we're playing. You know, the type of experience that is is being sought by, you know, the soul, the over soul or high self or whatever you want to call it. You know, it's looking for a type of evolutionary experience that is is not possible in in other mm. uh, you know states of being or different realms. Um, and so this, you know, the 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 I don't know what do you call it the the slowness or the the challenging sort of nature of physical existence brings brings kind of a certain opportunity with it the the difficulties that are inherent in it make it um you know an interesting challenge and leaves leaves the soul in a different state than you know when it entered the video game so to speak so yeah uh, you know i don't have less necessarily a, a, yeah. a firm a set point on the details of why it is so much slower to manifest but it is part partly to do with the nature of the this level of the dream <laughs> yeah and and we sort of maybe came into this level of the dream to have some kind of lesson to take back but then again on that during the ayahuasca experience i was thinking it had put in the intention and it was happening with like seconds later so it was um yeah 
it can happen under certain states of, uh, <laughs> you know, like, of, uh, you know, certain psychedelics and whatnot. But um, generally speaking, though, it's sort of a muddied intention and reflection field. You know, you might put out a weak, wishy-washy intention and you might get something back, you know, years later or something like that. Um, but yeah, mm -hmm. just seems to be how it is. Yep. Mm. It's, it's funny, you know, it can happen, like you said, like you found in the ayahuasca thing, it can happen really fast. Um, I was just saying a few days ago, I was walking down the, I was walking down a cobblestone road here in town and about 15 minutes earlier than I, like I found a coin and about 15 minutes prior to that, I had the, the mental, I don't know, I guess the intent and the visualization of, oh, you know, let's, it wouldn't it be great to find some money on the on the ground while we're walking along kind of thing and then you know sure enough 15 minutes later that's exactly what happened um and and mm. it's it can be it can be really quick i i think that you know you often hear people talk about how to manifest and this kind of thing and in that in that in, instance um it was i had a thought very briefly yeah. and there was a a certain amount of intention attached to it but i let i let it go and forgot about it very very quickly i didn't dwell on it or try to intend anything or will anything it just was there and it was gone and then sure enough you know moments later it was it was actually happening so you know mm -hmm. we don't necessarily need to overcomplicate things it's i think we we're really good at getting in our in our own way you know we sometimes we just need to have a make a choice and state of preference yeah Yeah, no, I agree. And actually, I'm um, I've been talking to a lot of guests who have witnessed satanic rituals and stuff like that, right? Where they sacrifice children and to this like demonic realm. It's very consistent amongst all the all the stories, all the testimonies, right? And then there's that kind of Faustian exchange where the demonic realm give them certain gifts and abilities and luck, you know. So actually, I'm interviewing a guy in about 40 minutes. He was a satanic. high wizard you know whatever they call it right and um, he's going to tell the story about how as a kid he just he was doing these he was summoning this demon and then he would ask for money and then he would on his way to school he would find find like wrapped up like loads of notes in an elastic band just there you know by the school and he was kept doing that and doing it so that's right this is so powerful you know but i'm actually thinking that what's happening there is that that demonic entity or that kind of in that demonic realm it can play within the quantum field. So it can basically go through all the kind of almost infinite timelines and pick the one where there was actually happened to be someone that left the money there and it can move, it shifts, it kind of, in a, you know, quantum leap like the, um, or maybe there's a movie that's maybe does this better, but it can move you into that particular timeline that had that money there. That's how it does it, I think. Mm. So I think that, you know, so that yes. that is that in that kind of, If you want to call them ascended masters or these de demon realms they are masters of the quantum world and they can push you they can move the train train onto the different tracks the different timelines that particular one that had that money there but we kind of perceive it as luck we could perceive that as yeah uh, magic miracle yeah and it may it may also be like in a port you know uh, a manifestation of something from directly from the oh, field right. itself the quantum field oh right yeah yeah Um, yeah, I never thought of that. What you mean, just yeah. like kind of just in that moment, it could just be, it could just manifest it and be waiting there for him. Potentially, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, you know, there's there's some really good research around manifest the manifestation of spirits into full body tangible form. I mean, if mm. if you know entities can do that, then why not create other objects? I mean, mm. you know, like. In in India, there's a history, the history of you know yogis being able to produce objects um, out of thin air, and some of it yeah. obviously, you know, for those of you who are cynics out there, I'm very aware that some of it is just trickery and, and whatever. But yeah. there is also uh, a genuine phenomenon where where things can manifest from what we think of as you know thin air or nothingness, but it's yeah. actually the information in the field being um, uh, what's the word like kind of congealed yeah. into something we can. detect and perceive as solid solid matter because ultimately that's all it really is just it's just information um just standing waves little nano vortices of standing waves being or organized into geometric form that we interpret as something solid and tangible but there there is nothing solid or tangible really at the end of the day it's all just swirling energy is that maybe why you have like these you know like the street hypnotists um that can make someone believe they're eating an apple and it's really an onion well maybe in in their own reality actually was an apple you know 
Um, but to everyone watching, it's an onion. But kind of in their own holographic reality, they've been hypnotized to reconfigure the 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 structure of that um apple into an onion, right? Or is the other way around. But uh, yeah, from the onion into an apple. So they're actually thinking it's an apple and they are actually eating an apple in their reality. But to everyone else watching, we're looking at it from a, it's like re rejigging the, the pixels on the screen to form something else. Um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe, maybe that's... Totally. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, it's like that person eating the onion. They're having the experience of, of eating an apple. And how, how can you, on the outside, who yeah. are we to say that they're not having the experience of eating an apple? <laughs> I mean, yeah, exactly. That's like that's what I'm saying. You yeah. can have these overlapping reality tunnels, yeah. and yeah. One, one reality tunnel is very different to the next one. It's like, well, yeah. what's objectively real then? Yeah, exactly. Because um, David Icke always gives the example about how um, they hypnotized a guy. Um, I think he held, held something behind his back, and then they hypnotized the guy to. Um, not be able to see that person in front of him and then he was able to say what was written on the pen that was behind his back because in that moment he was saying that you can actually reconfigure the reality that construct that you're seeing in front of you to remove that that person to only then see that the pen that was behind him that kind of thing isn't it this is this is what we're doing all of the time <laughs> yeah. yeah um it's just that you know in in situations like that it becomes really really obvious that something amazing is happening but we're, we're all doing it all the time like people people are hypnotized into a belief system and then the only information they perceive in in their reality is information that supports the belief system they edit they literally edit out and delete yeah, yeah. information so that it doesn't upset what they believe um and this happens unconsciously we don't even have to try um, and I think that that example you're talking about was actually from Michael Talbot's book, where the hypnotist um, he did he put this guy into a trance, yeah. and he held uh, his daughter with the watch. There was a watch behind her back. Maybe it's a and watch. And he put the guy into a trance and gave him a suggestion you, that he would he would be able to read what was on the watch, yeah. and effectively. Without, I, I don't even think he he told him, you know, you know, your daughter's invisible or whatever. He just gave him the suggestion that he would there would be no barrier to him being able to see what's on the on the watch. He'll be able to tell the time. But the watch for everybody else, the watch was hidden behind his daughter's back, and and yet somehow he was able to see exactly what the time was on it. So there you go, overlapping reality tunnels. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, I think you like you say we kind of do that anyway. If you look at the last three to four years you must have had this experience where you're walking with your friends and your family, but you're perceiving the reality in, 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 in a completely different way. You know, so for instance, they, they're like totally believing in the narrative of like, you need to have the jab, there's this deadly virus going along. And then there's the other people that are like, that's not my timeline. I don't see it like that. There is no virus. There is no pandemic. We don't need to wear a mask. Like the real problem is like the vaccine. I'm going to have to edit that <laughs> for YouTube, but you know, and it's like, <laughs> yeah. that's the real issue. And like, that's the real problem. That's what we need. To... And they're like, you crazy conspiracy theorists. And I'm like, you crazy normie. Like, how can you not see it? But we're stood <laughs> in exactly the same physical space, but our realities are completely like, like um, overlaid. Like there's, there's my reality and there's yours. And we're like in this kind of du dual reality right now. Have you had that experience like mm -hmm. with your friends and family in the last three, four years? Oh, Dude, try twenty years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you, you should you should have seen some of the the dinner table conversations we used to have. <laughs> um, really? Yeah, I mean it's it's it is because I would, I'd be the only one. You know, I, when I when I woke up, I was twenty, um, and I started with the metaphysical side of it before I went into the geopolitical conspiracy stuff. So, right. um, you know, for me, everybody was in this kind of weird like hypnotic trance you know unconsciousness and if they can't program they can't pro uh, process information that doesn't fit into the belief structure and, and when you're operating like that it's kind of it's essentially the same as being hypnotized you know it's like someone on stage who's been hypnotized to think that they're a chicken uh it's no different it's a it becomes a belief system and, and the focus of this this person or these people is so utterly narrowed their focus is it's like you know just look at the swinging yeah. you know, the the pendulum kind of thing and that's all they see and so you yeah. can entrain you can program them to just see that and everything outside of that just does not exist
Oh man, we we totally saw that, and especially the hypnosis. I've done a couple of episodes on that about you know the fractionation techniques they use by putting you in lockdown, taking you out for like a few weeks, and then putting you back in, and then back in again, back out again. You know, like that's how, that's like the fractionation technique of hypnosis. And then they had the the double binds, so like the you know, like up down, you can't be up and down at the same time. So the new Mm normal, -hmm. you can't be new and normal at the same time. And then they had alone together. <laughs> Alone together is another yeah. one. And then <laughs> yeah. um, what was the what's what was the, the big one? Um oh yeah, social distancing. You can't be social and distance at the same time because social is about togetherness and closeness, and you know, like uh distance is the Yeah. opposite of that. So these are all double binds. So there's loads of loads of hypnosis, the fear, the confusion aspect of it, where they would like be throwing us like different messages every day like Fauci would say wear a mask don't wear a mask wear a mask. you know like there was a lot of that going on at that level like the, the, the confusion element so there's definitely a lot of hypnosis going on but yeah you're right that people had that fixed myopic view of what the the narrative was and they were rejecting anything that didn't fit in alignment with that narrative and it was quite yeah it's quite frightening like you said like the chicken it's just the chicken only like even though there's other stuff going on it's just like oh, only the information that reinforces that that's a chicken in front of me that kind of thing isn't it Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Mm. That's and that's exactly what happened. That's they and these they know how to do this. Like they've got they've invested hundreds of oh millions yeah of dollars into mind control, mass mind control. I mean, you know this. So they've yeah got it perfected. They understand how easy and it is to control the masses. They understand mass psychology to a T and how stupid the masses are. And it's only when you you function as an individual who's in charge of yourself. that you, you you stop being so subject to that but they've got it figured out like they've got layers of of the onion of control like you know first it's like oh you know cooties 19 i like to call it clown vid clown vid 19 right this is real and we're all gonna die and then you have another level of oil oh well no they lied about a bunch of stuff and it was actually released from a bio lab somewhere and Yeah. and all these layers of, of keeping people inside the narrative Yeah. and keeping them fixated on this on this very blinkered Um, portion of re reality, which is just the narrative, um, so that they don't see anything else. And it's, it is, you just see what you focus on. Remember that there was a, something that circulated not long ago, a few years back, it was going around, there was a video. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? A guy in a monkey, a gorilla suit, running in between a bunch of people who are throwing Yeah, a basketball yeah, yeah. around. Yeah. And, and they're like, how many times, you know, did the, uh, you know, count the number of times they passed the ball kind of thing. And Yeah, so you you're don't sitting see there focusing it. on the basketball. Yeah, And yeah. you get to the end and you're like, oh, yeah, I think they passed it like 23 times or something. And then they go, oh, what about the guy in the gorilla suit? And you're like, fucking guy in a gorilla suit? What are you talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he was right there on the screen. You go back and look at it. He's there the whole friggin' time. And you It's didn't exactly see it because like you were that. given the suggestion. Yes. You were given the suggestion to focus on hyper focus Yes. on only the basketball. So the rest of the reality and any anomalies, anomalies Yeah. would not be seen and go unnoticed. It's exactly that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to stick that in before you explain it. So I'm going to actually get the audience to do that first. And then like, I think that'd be good for everyone. But, I, but the thing is, is that once you've then seen that gorilla, you can't be fooled again though, right? Um, you know, they have those kind of Maybe not by tests. the same gorilla. Sorry? I said maybe not by the same gorilla. <laughs> Maybe not by the same gorilla, yeah. But you'd sort of hope that they would see it eventually and then it would kind of break the spell a little bit and then they'd be able to see it. But um, unfortunately, they, they aren't A lot able of people. to see it. Yeah. They aren't Yeah, able go to ahead. see Sorry. it. The Sorry. way that Go ahead. I see it is that we can see problem, reaction, solution. We can see where they want to move it to and then we can see the... The steps that they take to reach that point right so that's so i always give predictions and i always say that once you know the destination you can see the journey so i say to people this is what's going to happen that they, they, they're going to um you know create a, a central uh, digital currency they're going to try and move us into one world army they're going to 
You know, they're going to try and lock us down. They're going to try and ban traveling. They're going to try and monopolize the food source because I know that's where it's heading, right? It's not that I'm prof prophetic. Mm -hmm. It's just that I'm, I know that's the end point and I can work backwards. But it seems to me that these people, my friends and family, they can't work. They can't see things backwards. They can't do a Columbo. You know, they cannot yeah. see the potential end goal and then go, okay, let's see what that would look like working up to that. You know, it, it's just, yeah. I don't know, just a different way of, no. you know, perceiving things. But, yeah. I mean, I mean, this is the thing. Like, once you get, and they understand, like, they understand the power of belief systems. And once you get somebody into a belief system, like, someone's worldview, like, you're talking about somebody's worldview. So, you know, you, mom and dad, and most of our parents and grandparents or whatever, have an established worldview that says X, Y, Z happens and ABC does not happen. This wouldn't happen. You know, the government wouldn't do that to us. This is not possible. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, viruses are real, blah, 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 all this stuff. This, this is their worldview. And then in that information grid, the only information, the only data that can get filtered yeah. through that is data that supports it. Yeah. And so when we've already had 200 years of, for example, germ theory, programming, brainwashing, complete propaganda and fraud, just scientific mm -hmm. garbage, 200 years, there is nobody alive on the planet right now that was not born into that matrix of deception and manipulation. And it's yeah. very hard to get people to see water that they've been swimming in from the moment they, they were born because it's invisible. It's just the way yeah. the world is. This is a core belief. When you hear people go, oh, it's just how things are, that's a core belief. And that is, that's a hypnosis. That's a self-hypnosis that they cannot break out of until mm -hmm. they allow themselves the opportunity to do that. But they've got all this psychological armoring, emotional armoring that holds the worldview in place. It's, and you know, people get triggered. They get irate if you show them, try to show them something like, Here's somebody who was vaccine injured. Oh my God. <laughs> like that doesn't yeah. happen. Vaccines are the greatest thing since sliced bread. You know, I'm gonna have to edit that out. Sorry, brother. But yeah, um, this, I'll have to, I'll this is it. how it works. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Why do they get so angry though? Like is it because for, for them to realize that that is wrong within their uh, belief system it might be like a domino effect where it might knock the next domino and not next domino and they're kind of fright they're kind of frightened of letting that first domino fall to kind of collapse the entire worldview and then they would realize my whole life has been a lie do you think that's maybe what's happening there that's a huge huge part of it um and and i can tell you my within my own family i actually a conversation we had with my dad in the last uh, maybe two years ago, before we left uh, Australia, yeah. he said exactly exactly that. What you just what you just described is because the resistance is partly because he he realizes on some level that if he has if he acknowledges what I'm saying, what I've been saying for twenty years, yeah. then like you just said, his whole life has been a lie. In a, in a, at least on some level, it's been a lie, like an mm -hmm. illusion. These so many illusions piled on top mm -hmm. of each other. And the problem that people have is we come into this world, this virtual reality game, we forget we don't have the memory of who and what we really are. So we build an identity that mm -hmm. then becomes tied into this worldview that we're talking about. So we have, if somebody threatens the worldview with a piece of data that doesn't fit, it also threatens the ego structure that is enmeshed in the worldview. And that's very threatening. We don't like that. It makes us very uncomfortable. It makes us angry, you know, blah, blah, blah. So we see this all the time with people getting triggered by data that doesn't fit their programming. You know, the, the hostility mm. towards the, the pure bloods over the last three years has been off the charts because people don't want to have to face the possibility that yeah. their worldview is bullshit and that they've been misled intentionally and scammed and lied to. And that the fact that there's actually a global genocide going on, you know. Um, so I mean, it's horrible. Like, it's horrible. If you, if, for, for somebody to have to face that in the last three years, like to come to that realization, I yeah. think back to where I, when I first hit the David Icke stuff, right? Early on in my journey, I had the metaphysical awakening. Then yeah. the next stage was the David Icke geo, geopolitical control yeah. system. And, that hit me so hard in the guts, even though I already had a spiritual foundation, that I had to I put that book down for a month yeah. before I came back to it. I've got 99 pages in. I still remember 99 pages in. Yeah. And I left it for a month and came back to it because I needed a little bit of integration time yeah. to let that start seeking in. And then, you know, you, you know, like we get the agenda, the big picture and where it's all going. But for somebody to have to face 
this is a genocide and, and the what they're calling medicine is actually a weapon designed to kill you and millions of you yeah. to cull the herd, to control. I mean, that's a horrible thing that does not fit into 99% yeah. of people's worldviews at all. So mm. it's uh, there's massive levels of resistance and no, no one wants to believe that. Like, I totally understand. No one would want to have to believe that. Just like yeah. it was made me sick to my stomach when I first got the, started to get the picture, you know, mm. years ago. Yeah, of course. They just, it's kind of um, blissful this for ignorance isn't it that they want you know just just keep things happy, happy yeah like take the red pill and, you know? take the red pill yeah red, red a blue pill yeah take the blue pill just be happy you know don't sorry worry. yeah blue pill go back eat, eat your steak and be happy <laughs> yeah exactly yeah, yeah that's why he went back to the blue pill <laughs> yeah. by the way thank you so much for for coming on that was that was great man like yeah i feel we could uh chat chat about loads of things there um straight into the high dimensionality and everything else but yeah no i really like your uh, channel and what you're doing and the guests you're bringing on there seems to be like a shared sort of cur curiosity to the world and consciousness and everything else and i know you mentioned your book there do you want to um this is your second book do you want to mention your first book as well and um and also this new one you're writing yeah cool uh well people can find the first one at uh brendandmurphy.com slash tg I it's called the grand illusion um and if they want to check out reviews or just buy a copy the lowest prices do happen to be on my website not not on amazon or whatever um yeah so it's all about the deep dive into the nature of reality consciousness um very you know very broad but also deep like tying things together and connecting dots that are not normally you know connected so that we can build a, a perspective view of things like i like to say you know so it's not just about one little thing it's yeah. i mean the thread is consciousness and you know infinite consciousness and this is what we are and then it's kind of like well what else happens within that container and what is what is the nature of reality what is the nature of consciousness and it ends up being the same question the same answer um, but it's a very interesting exploration to, to spend, you know, 10,000 hours or more, um, mm. you know, studying it from a lot of different angles. And so the second book moves from the, where the first one ends, the second one picks up and goes more into, you know, the, the so-called quantum side of things. So we kind of like more into the out of body, non-physical realms. And, and it's a very, I dare say, a very unique exploration of non-physical existence, uh, which has not been done before. Yeah, fantastic. But yeah, Brendan, nice one, mate. I feel like we kind of <laughs> we went straight in with no uh, messing around there, straight into the deep end, didn't we? Um, yeah, great to have you on, buddy. Uh, thanks, man. Appreciate it. It's been fun. And uh, yeah, I like to get straight into it. Let's not mess around. <laughs> <laughs> no foreplay is straight in. Um, all right, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> all right, man. Thanks for that. It's been good.